Okay, everybody is saying good, loud and clear, so we shall start now. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Uh, this is our usual disclaimer. So today we'll be presenting on three different stocks in our house coverage. Uh, but before that, we'll go into the strategy first. So what we are saying is that uh, the strategy is to buy defensive. We are looking at uh, headwinds in the markets now. First one is the uncertainty in timing of the interest rate hike by the Fed. So the uh, hike in interest rate has been delayed. And so with this uncertainty of when it will actually happen, uh, there will be volatility in the market. Every time there's a rumor or there's an opinion, uh, prices the prices will be volatile. The second point is um, concerns on the China economy slowing down. Uh, and thirdly, third point is um, commodity slump on weak global demand. So actually, a bit on the China economy and if you um, follow the macroeconomic for Singapore as well, uh, there's a high chance that uh, Singapore actually was in a technical recession also in uh, third quarter of this year. So what we are advocating now is um, to buy defensive and so we have identified these uh, three stocks uh, with the following characteristics. They are non-cyclical uh, and they have strong operating cash flow and consequently from their cash flow they have a history of paying dividends. So this is the first uh, stock that we are going to speak about today, uh, 800 Super. Uh, last close was 48 cents on Friday, target price uh, 66 cents. 52-week uh, range, uh, 40 cents to 57 cents, and the uh, market cap is about 86 million. So if you look at this chart on this page now, uh, maybe you think that, oh, not very exciting, price going sideways, uh, but uh, wait till you see the next chart. Yeah. So uh, the green line shows the STI index, while the white line is the chart for 800 Super, uh, this chart shows a year-to-date performance since January of this year and uh, you can see that uh, 800 Super has outperformed uh, the benchmark index uh, and okay so the strategy for trying to get a position in this uh, is that you should uh, monitor it and um, buy on dips buy on those uh, unwarranted uh, knee-jerk reactions. So I'll just um, highlight this point here. Uh, sometime in August, you see that uh, there was sharp selling here. This coincided with the time when uh, China decided to devalue the yuan. And But today, you see the price has already recovered from that low point. And um, whereas if you compare with STI, STI is still going down. Um, so you need to keep an eye and when you see this kind of like indiscriminate selling for no good reason at all, this is when you try to get in. Uh, if you think about it, what has the um, devaluation of the yen got to do with uh, rubbish collection in Singapore? Absolutely nothing. So I'll just go a bit of uh, background uh, of the company. It's an environmental services provider for the public and private sector. They have three complementary business segments, which is uh, waste management and recycling, cleaning and conservancy, and lastly, horticultural services. So there's some uh, form of vertical integration in their business, uh, which is the waste in terms of the waste collection and the recycling. And the other thing is uh, upcoming is that they are uh, building their own biomass plant and that will handle some of the horticultural waste as well. Uh, business model, they have three 
key segments. First one is waste management and recycling. So they are actually one of four uh, companies which have been appointed by NEA who are eligible to bid for contracts to uh, collect waste in Singapore. Uh, so they recently had one of their contract renewed for waste collection in the Ang Mokyo Topayo sector. Uh, this was last year and this contract will last for seven years and nine months. The, moving on to their second uh, business segment will be cleaning and conservancy. Oh, they are one of four contractors uh, also appointed by NEA. Uh, to bid for these contracts for street cleaning in Singapore. Uh, they ha currently have two contracts which are for the northwest and southwest regions of Singapore. Apart from this, uh, they also do uh, contract cleaning for residential, commercial, industrial and institutional clients. Uh, next is horticultural services. Uh, this business um, encompasses grass cutting, tree pruning, landscape planning and maintenance services. So their uh, clients include end parks and schools, residential, commercial and institutional clients. This slide just shows the general um, industry trends. The, the charts on the right uh, the data from MEWR, Ministry of Environment and Water Resources. Actually, the data on these three charts show exactly the same thing. It's just that um, the information has been uh, arranged in a different way. So in the first chart, you just what you see is um, it's the total waste generated in Singapore has been growing. If you just look at the last 10 years, it's been growing at a CAGR of 4.6%. Second chart, uh, it's the same exact same numbers, just that um, now what you sh is being shown is the absolute quantity. And so I'll draw your attention to 2004 here. This is when uh, the amount of recycled waste in Singapore actually overtook the amount of waste that's being incinerated. So uh, recycled waste in the last 10 years has been growing, a uh, CAGR of 6.8%. And in contrast to 2.4% for incinerated waste. So what this means is that uh, more of our waste is actually being recycled instead of just being um, incinerated. And lastly, the third chart shows that, um, well, the common sense is that the proportion in terms of proportion of uh, recycled waste that has been increasing as well. So from uh, 2004 right here, uh, it was 48%, um, but now um, it's at 60%. Uh, going on to the market structure, so they have uh, two uh, for, for their waste collection and recycling. Um, it's an oligopoly of four players competing in for nine sectors. Uh, 800 Super uh, has this sector here, the Ang Mokyo Topayo sector. So this NEA contract lasts for about seven years uh, and while there are other waste collection contracts with other clients last for two to three years. So for this NEA contract, what they're responsible for is to collect all the uh, trash from uh, landed property and HDB uh, estates within this uh, boundary here. And so the other clients could be places like the shopping malls and the private condos. So second point, uh, cleaning and conservancy, they have, the, the market structure is also an oligopoly consisting of four players as well, and they are competing for seven regions. So there are current contracts for the north-south, uh, sorry, the northwest and the southwest 
regions of Singapore, they last for six years. And their other cleaning contracts for other non-NEA clients last for about two to three years. Positive catalysts uh, going forward for Neandra Super would be uh, the completion of their second material recovery facility. In layman terms, it's just a recycling sorting center. So this uh, second plant is uh, currently under construction. Uh, what happened, what, what the, the positive catalyst would be that um, they can improve their margins through lowering of their incineration costs and resale of built recyclables. So what this means is that um, for all the trash that they collect, they actually have to send it to the incineration plant and they have to pay about $80 per ton of waste that they incinerate. So if they can actually uh, siphon out some of the waste which can be recycled, then they would actually be bringing less, less waste to the uh, incineration plant and thereby reducing their incineration expense. And at the same time, for all these uh, recyclable waste that they have sorted, they can sell it to those reprocessors as well. Second bullet point, waste to energy incineration plant. Uh, this is the biomass plant which I mentioned earlier. So it's uh, specifically catered for horticultural waste for, that, would, um, that comes from their horticultural services uh, business. In terms of valuation, the first um, table shows uh, they are shows 800 super when compared against their closest peer, which is also listed on the Singapore Exchange. Uh, that's Colex Holdings. Colex Holdings also um, deals with the collection of waste in Singapore. Um, these price multiples they are trailing, uh, but you can see uh, just um, as a rough guide. Uh, 800 super is set uh, 4.9 times PE, whereas um, Colex 8 times PE. So this is based on trailing basis. Uh, on a forward PE wise, um, 800 super is really undeservedly cheap at uh, 5.4 times PE. This is uh, based on our estimate of uh, 8.86 cents um, EPS for FY16 and um, based on last Friday's closing price. So the key risks involved for 800 Super is uh, firstly their inability to maintain NEA contracts. So they have to uh, bid for the contract. So as this forms quite a substantial uh, portion of their uh, revenue, um, this would be a risk in that if they are not able to um, renew their contracts. So they have these, uh, currently they have these three NEA contracts which is for the waste collection in uh, to, in the Ang Mokyo Topayo sector as well as the public cleaning in the northwest and southwest sectors of Singapore and these three contracts will be concluding in 2020 and 2021. The other uh, key risk is, comes from uh, staff costs. Uh, staff costs contrib uh, constitutes about, um, or rather, it, uh, staff costs uh, eats away about 48% of revenue. And so under a uh, labor crunch uh, situation and where wages are going up, uh, this would uh, put pressure on their margins as well. Investment merits, uh, so they have a high barrier to entry. Um, there are two core business segments of waste management and public cleaning. Both operate in an oligopoly uh, and these contracts last for several years. So they actually, um, so it creates a high barrier to entry once you have uh, attained the contract and then it also gives them uh, visible revenue recognition for the following years. The distinct competitive advantage is that they have a material recovery facility which uh, Colex doesn't have and so this would also improve uh, their margins as I've explained earlier. 
next thing is, is a recession proof business model. So uh, by collecting waste is actually a non-cyclical essential service. And uh, lastly, to tie in with um, one of our um, introductory points on history of paying dividends. So Andrew Super does pay dividends uh, and we forecast uh, 2.55 cents for this FY and that would translate to a, a yield of 5.3% uh, based on uh, last close price. So to conclude, we have a buy rating on 800 Super with a target price of uh, 66 cents. Uh, now um, I'll hand over to my colleague Te Hong who will uh, present on Fraser Center Point Trust. Hi, good morning guys, The Hong here. So the next talk we are going to cover today is Fraser Center Point Trust. Okay, I think this shouldn't be a, a very unfamiliar name to all of you. They basically what FCT does is they are uh, they have they are they have a Singapore centric and a suburban team to their business model. So currently they own a total of six suburban malls in Singapore. So basically, if you walk around Singapore, you look at the malls and you see, if you see malls with names that ends with a point like Causeway Point, North Point, be, mostly all of them should be under the Fraser's family. Or if you look at like Center Point or Compass Point, even though these are not under FCT, but they are under the Fraser's Center Point Limited, the developer, which is FCT's parent. So for FCT, what they have under their portfolio, if you look at the percentage of contribution to the NPI for the latest quarter, the two biggest malls under the portfolio are actually Causeway Point and North Point. So these are the dominant malls in their respective areas, in their respective catchment areas. So Causeway Point in Woodlands, North Point in Yishun. Before I go in to talk about the all the little micro performance metrics of the company, I'll just talk about like if you take a step back and you look at the long-term picture of the, the, the portfolio, right? What are the prospects for these malls in these areas? So if you look at Causeway Point in Woodlands, which is about half what half the, the portfolio, half the net property income for FCT in the past quarter. You look at Woodlands, right? Woodlands is actually one of the largest housing estates in Singapore after Bedok and after Jurong. So over there and then they're slated to become the next um, regional business hub in Singapore because now the government is trying to decentralize like you see that's why you see a lot of uh, business parks in those suburban areas and then government is trying to encourage them to move outside because CBD is getting too congested and after Tampines after Jurong Woodlands is slated to be the next regional hub so I think all these all these factors point to a more bright bright future for that that region and you can expect an increase in vibrancy in that region as well. As for North Point and Yishun, I think Yishun is a relatively under region in my opinion because if you look at North Point, the, North Point is actually not a very big mall. It is about half the size of Causeway Point. It is about, about the same size as Bedok Mall. But if you look at the traffic they are able to garner and they are able to attract, North Point actually attracts a foot a uh, traffic and annual traffic of easily double that of Bedok Mall. Right, and if you talk about Bedok Mall, we are talking about a very, very solid mall, which is why CMT paid so much for them in the first place, right? So given that North Point, I think North Point is is relatively even if there's gonna be a supply coming up, Yishun, the Yishun area should be able to absorb this increase in supply. And also if you look at Yishun, the next upcoming mall that is going to come up is North Point City actually and that is also under Fraser Center Point under the parent so they're currently developing that and then I think when it gets stabilized it might get passed down to FCT as well so we talked about 
prospects for the current malls, the two biggest malls I've covered. How about like future future growth as uh, prospects for FCT? So apart from these um, prospects that the current malls have, if you look at what is in the pipeline from their sponsor for FCT, the next one very likely is going to be Waterway Point. We have mentioned this mall before. It's going to be the first mall in, in Pong Pongo. There are really no big malls currently. It's going to be the first mall in Pongo with a cinema as well. It's going to be the, the mall with a 24-hour NTUC. And then it's going to be an integrated development over there. So it's um, the water, water town together with the water town, water town, the condo, which is almost fully sold out. Like I think only about six units out of a thousand left. And then, and then if you talk about Waterway Point, it's, it's still about half a year from opening. And FCL has already declared that they have already gotten 90% pre-commitment, despite being still half a year away from opening. So I think when that mall comes into the portfolio, it's going to be a very solid and stable mall for FCT. But I think we'll, we'll be looking at about maybe 2017 or 18 for that. So now let's look at how FCT has done over the past year, year to date. Since July, since June, July, when we saw the Chinese market crashed and then concerns came in about China's growth and then the, the impending rate hike, we saw the REIT sector in tandem with other sectors in the, in the, in the general market as well generally coming down and then but if you take a step back you look at the whole performance for the whole year actually fct for the entire year is relatively flat along the way you would have collected dividends about six percent not too bad i would say if you look at how the sti has done for year to date sti is down about if you look at the green line for sti is down about close to 18 percent so my next part of um, the argument for buying FCT, I'll divide it into three main big parts. So basically the three main investment merits, firstly, defensive portfolio of suburban malls. When you think of suburban malls, you think of like necessity spending, more resilient, spend, more resilient spending, which are less reactive to the cycles of the economy. And then secondly, over the past few years, I think we've seen an increasing appeal of suburban malls to international retailers, not just, you know, suburban malls, usually they cater to like your mid-tier brands, your G2000, your Giordano's, but increasingly we are seeing like, you know, even the higher end brands, they are showing a preference of going towards suburban malls and I'll touch on this later on. Lastly, if you look at FCT, you compare its valuations historically for the past five years, you, you see that it's actually trading at pretty compelling valuation, which I'll show you a chart for later as well. Then next, okay, we, we start on the first point, defense, defensive portfolio of suburban malls. So we talked about like FCT owning a portfolio of suburban malls that's supposed to be relatively stable, resilient, defensive, right? How does that show up in the occupancy rates? If you look at the two top two malls, Causeway Point and North Point, apart from the, the years where the management was trying to do AEIs, AEI basically they try to do some renovation works or you know like if you look at what Suntech has just done, they, they extended a, a whole new wing of um, retail shops. So basically these are renovation works to try to improve and increase the property income that you can get by introducing more space or cu customizing the entire layout of the mall when management is doing this kind of asset enhancement works usually you would expect occupancy rates to fall is very normal so these are the yellow boxes but we can see that other than outside of this time time frames where management is trying to do AEIs you see, you see that occupancy rates are actually very very stable or very close to 100 and then, and then if you look at the smaller malls, you have Anchor Point, Bedok Point, UT Point, Changi City Point. So for UT Point, so for all of them, there have been transition periods, periods of like, you know, 
management trying to adjust tenant mix. Sometimes you see occupancy dropping slightly, but even when you see them dropping slightly, you're still looking at numbers like 95%, 96%, still pretty healthy numbers, right? And then if you look at <clears throat> UT points, for example, in this three years, so occupancy dropped a little, but net property income still grew in this three years, despite the fall, slight fall in the occupancy. Right, so if you look at the entire portfolio as a whole, we look at years where you know they are not affected or distorted by AEIs, right? Actually, very stable numbers, very close to 100. And then, so let's look at the bottom line, right? What we are all interested in the DPU since IPO in 2006, FCT has managed to grow DPU every single year every single year despite no matter what happens in the economy. So we know that you know property prices they move in cycles, but then for shopping malls, I think there's there's a lot more to it in that you, you can see you can see rental rates dipping. But then if you have a mall that is the a dominant mall in the area like Woodlands, you hardly can find any other malls in the in the vicinity or Yishun Northway Point. If you have these dominant malls there is going to be demand for your shop space. And then basically running a mall, if you have the ability to generate footfall, if you have the ability to generate tenant sales for your for your tenants, right? Even if you see like a general, I think if you see a general slight drop in the rental index, but you know, if you can go to your tenants and say, look, I've carried out all these promotional events, you know, when there's the Mooncake Festival, then they'll organize like Mooncake Fest. These are all ways that the management can use to draw in crowds or you know like when there are mega stars coming over to Singapore like how you saw Michael Owen came over to Singapore and then you, some of the malls they did autograph sessions <clears throat> for tennis star Sharapova as well. These are all the ways that management can do to draw in the crowd and I think for FCT you are looking at a management that is very very good at doing all this and that is showing up in this chart because for every single year they have been able to grow the DPU regardless of what happens in the macro, the macro environment. Because if you look at 2009, Lehman collapsed. 2011, we had the Greek crisis, right? All this didn't seem to affect, and they were able to grow DPU year after year. So just now I talked about <coughs> increasing a pew of suburban malls to all these international retailers, right? Not just your mid-tier brands, but also increasingly you look at you're looking at all these high-end brands starting to move outwards as well. You look at okay, I think one notable, two notable brands in this slide. You look at cost. This is a uh, this is the sister brand of H&M, Swedish brands. They opened in Westgate in 2013. For cost, the other outlet they have is actually in Raffles City. And then for Coach, you're looking at the first big luxury retailer in US actually setting up shop in a suburban mall in Singapore. Because if you look at Coach, right, all the other outlets they have, they're all in the likes of your MBS, your 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 Takashimaya, your Wisma Atria. Gem is the first outlet Coach has outside downtown. Right. And I think the reason for all this phenomenon in that these brands are increasingly open to the idea of um, opening in a suburban mall is because they are confident of the <clears throat> of the ability of the location to generate the sales for them. And then if you think about some other brands like Uniqlo, you now you see them everywhere, right? You see them in Plaza Singh, you see them in Vivo City. You see them in your Ion, you see them in 313 Orchard, all the downtown malls. But remember when Uniqlo first came over to Singapore in 2009? Where was the first place they chose to list or to open shop? It's not in a downtown mall. They, sh they first chose to open shop in Tampines 1. And I guess that that's also because they are confident of the ability of the location to be able to join the crowds and to be able to uh, generate sales. And for the record, it did not take them <clears throat> do not take them that long for that Tampani store to break even. So we talked about increasing a pew of um, suburban spaces. 
to all these retailers. So how does it translate into actual numbers on the ground? We should expect to see a general increase in the rental rates for 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 the tenants, right? For for the landlords, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't. There's no use of about talking talking about all this when it doesn't translate to increased earnings. So, indeed, if you look at the blue line from post GFC, right, it's actually gone up. The fringe area more uh, fringe area fringe area rental index has gone up. Not only has it gone up, it has outperformed the city area index as well. So I think this chart shows a very compelling valuation comparison for the company for the past five years post GFC. In 2011, you saw this, you, you see this dip. In 2013, you see this uh, correction again. 2011, we had this um, EU crisis where Greece was getting threatened to get kicked out of the EU. 2013, the EU debt crisis resurfaced again. But in addition to that, why we had this big crash is also because there's this taper tantrum going on because Bernanke was actually saying that he will scale back in his bond purchases. So turning off the liquidity tab. When they turn on the liquidity tab, liquidity tab markets rallied. And now when it's payback time, I suppose there should be some kind of correction. Now we're having 2015. We're having the same problem. We're having like uncertainties over uh, Fed interest rate hike, like what Richard just mentioned, as, as well as China's um, worries. So I think if you look at this chart, I think barring any Lehman-like kind of collapse, that kind of big scale incidents, we could be just looking at noise in the market, like cor normal corrections for a healthy bull market. So barring any that kind of event, we could be looking at a base and a consolidation period where it trades at like, you see the price trading between these two ranges, the plus minus one standard deviations. For the next chart, I'm going to see, I'm going to present the dividend U is actually simply just the inverse of the PB table because we saw that FCT has been able to grow DPU year after year, right? So if you see a, if you see a, a drop in a U, it can only be because the prices have been going up and not because of U is going down because we saw that every single year they're able to grow DPU. So really we're looking at just the inverse of PB chart and then for now we are look, we are, we are doing about 6.1% U, already higher than the average for the past five years. And you saw that you saw that for the past five years we are basically fluctuating between a lot of times between these two ranges, the plus and minus one standard deviations. So lastly we look at peer comparison. Closest peer I would say is CMT, of course, because they primarily do suburban malls as well. A bit of a bit of um, downtown malls, they have Plaza Singh, they have like Bugis Junction, they have Clark Key as well. But still I think if you were to compare, CMT would have to be the closest one you compare to. Then you if you look at like hey, you ask me, hey, why not I buy, you know, look at Star Hill Global, it's only trading at 0 0.8 or SunTech is only trading at 0 0.7, right? I'm getting a lower PB here, but yet I get a higher U. Doesn't they look like better buys for than than FCT? So I would say different companies that they, they they actually have different inherent sets of risk. So comparing FCT to SunTech read across like that is is not comparing apples to apples. If you look at SunTech read, they actually have office spaces as well. So they are they're exposed to the to the ups and downs of the office sector, which is actually not looking very good currently because demand is slowing and supply is going up. You look at Starhill Global as well. They are actually exposed to Orchard Road. They own all the Orchard Road malls, your Takashimaya. So that, that one is a different set of dy dynamics again. And then if you look at these two, if you look at Starhill, it's currently trading at 0 0.8. But during the 2001 correction where we had the EU debt crisis, Starhill was actually trading at about 0 0.6 plus 0 0.7 times PB. But FCT during that period of time, the same period of time, it bottomed out at about one times PB as well. And I think that's testament to the stability of the portfolio that they have. So I think the closest comparison, co closest competitor is CMT. PB now about the same, but FCT having slightly higher U. 
despite I think what would be a portfolio which is more defensive and more stable and lower gearing and lower cost of debt as well. So I think with that, I'll pass on to Lin Sin for the next company's update, Sing Xiong Group. Thank you, Tahong. Uh, this is uh, Lin Sin, your consumer analyst. So today, uh, I'll also be touching on uh, another com uh, very familiar brand name for most of the Singapore household, Sing Xiong. So basically, I'll first uh, go through how the consumer sector uh, in Singapore like at the moment and also um, then I'll move on to a snapshot on the company then uh, we also will be presenting on the four investment merits on why you should uh, why you should invest in uh, Sing Xiong then uh, a brief uh, overview on the Kiwis and uh, to end up the presentation yep so without further ado uh, the consumer sector in uh, Singapore. So in the top chart, uh, you can see that the, this orange bar shows you Singapore's uh, GDP. And as you can see that our economy has been slowing down throughout the uh, past five years. Sorry, throughout the past uh, four years. So, and uh, as you can see that from for the red line, which indicates uh, the private consumption, component in our GDP is actually quite resilient, still floating up and supporting our uh, Singapore's uh, economy as compared to as compared to our uh, investment is our infrastructure uh, sorry yeah our, our investment has been actually uh, going down taking a dip due to the answer to this in 2014 after uh, US uh, unwind is QE. And at the bottom chart, um, you look into um, the, comp the goods versus the services industries in uh, the GDP. So in this component, as you can see that the green line, which shows you the services sector, is actually quite um, resilient as well. Uh, as compared to um, the manufacturing sector, which actually took a hit due to our uh, domestic uh, restructuring. Yeah. So as such, um, we look further into uh, the servicing sector, which is the retail sales. So for this chart, uh, I've actually pulled out the retail sales index, uh, excluding motor vehicles, uh, as motor vehicles are actually quite volatile due to the COE premium fluctuations. So as you can see that uh, from starting of this year, uh, we are seeing that our retail sales is actually picking up and uh, into the supermarket uh, sub-index, you can actually see that it's uh, gaining traction. Uh, with all this, uh, we actually concluded that uh, consumer staples remains uh, defensive, uh, which is uh, considerably a good investment strategy to take on uh, at this uh, amid this uh, uncertainties uh, time. And also we think that uh, it could also ride the cyclical upturn in the uh, future when uh, we are getting uh, wealthier, uh, sorry, yeah, when people are, when we see that the GDP is recovering and uh, the when the wealth effect uh, kick in, then uh, people would be purchasing more. On the other hand, um, Let's take a look at the inflation um, inflation chart. Uh, as you can see that our Singapore economy is actually facing a deflationary pressure at the moment, here indicated by the uh, blue line. And this is actually the core inflation index, uh, which excludes um, accommodation as well as uh, motor vehicles. And from here as well, we can see that uh, inflation remains uh, benign. Uh, this um, actually it's uh, good news uh, in short term for both consumers as well as uh, companies as uh, we are uh, as consumer perceive that uh, goods are get uh, goods are and goods remain cheap they will purchase more and uh, for companies uh, they don't uh, face any uh, cost pressures at the moment but um, if this situation is to prolong 
then um, the, this might hamper the economy growth as uh, people will be uh, more reluctant to spend uh, as they are expecting that the prices might go down for the in, in future. Uh, nevertheless, uh, actually MS um, indeed mentioned that uh, they do not expect any um, deflation uh, in Singapore. So uh, whatever that they are seeing in the inflation um, indicator, it might be in near term only until that uh, when US eventually in increase their interest rate, uh, then we might be importing uh, inflation from abroad. So uh, next, we move on to Singshong uh, company snapshot. So basically, uh, this chart shows shows that uh, Singshong actually outperformed uh, STI year to date, giving you a up to nineteen percent um, return. Next, uh, we move on to uh, the company's overview. I believe that everyone is quite familiar with uh, Singshong, so uh, what do they provide and uh, things like that. I'm, so I shall not uh, go further into details where, uh, regarding uh, the company's overview. Uh, anyway, just to update you guys that uh, Singshong currently has uh, 38 outlets uh, across island-wide. Um, island Sorry, uh, has 38 outlets island wide and uh, spending uh, over 446 uh, square feet as of uh, October. So, uh, this slide actually highlights the four key investment mer merits on why should you should consider Singshong. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, Singshong is because uh, firstly, uh, Singshong is a very Singapore-centric uh, business, where we are seeing there's a growing uh, customer base with rising affluence, and hence uh, there's also a change, a shift in a uh, purchasing pattern scene. Then uh, secondly, the growing story uh, for Singshong remains intact. Thirdly. It has a superior margin as compared to its peers. Last, it has a very strong cash flow position, zero debt, and uh, a prudent management style where they expand using excess cash. Okay, let's go into uh, more details on the first point where we are seeing uh, where the Singapore government is actually targeting 6.9 million. Uh, of uh, Singapore population as of uh, 2030. And this chart actually shows you uh, that Singap Singaporeans are actually getting richer by year. And uh, this dark blue bar is actually showing you how much that Singaporean are willing to uh, take out from their pockets uh, for modern grocery spending. So as you can see that both uh, charts are showing a rising trend. And as uh, Singaporeans are heading towards a higher standard uh, higher standard of living, uh, we are seeing that there's a shift in uh, from traditional to modern grocers. Uh, Singaporeans tend to um, buy, purchase their vet, uh, uh, sorry, purchase their um, fresh foods or the vet products from a cleaner air conditioned environment. For example, um, e even in, uh, uh, sorry, uh, let me rephrase. Yeah, rather than uh, see, rather than seeing them uh, in buying from uh, mom and pops uh, uh, shops or in uh, the vet market every morning, then uh, they also uh, tend to go for a single one stop which provides a wide variety of products at the cheaper prices. And uh, due to the longer working hours uh, in Singapore, Singchong actually provides a longer operating hours. Uh, this will cater to the working population. 
Okay, second, the expanding retail area. So we are actually expecting that um, there will be an additional 18% uh, more retail space in the next uh, two years. Uh, these new stores would drive sales in near term. And also, um, Sing Chong has actually uh, entered into a JV with uh, Lu Chen Group in Kunming. And we are ex expecting uh, its very first store to open uh, towards uh, in the uh, fourth quarter, meaning this quarter. And this uh, first shop would be uh, the one uh, the one shop for them to uh, test water in a uh, China market as well as uh, for them to write on the China's uh, consumer story as we know that uh, China is actually trying to shift to a consumption based uh, economic growth model. So uh, calling the management, uh, they are actually um, saying that they will continue to search for expansion opportunities. Uh, both domestically and as well as uh, overseas. So in near term, um, the management actually targets to uh, expand up to 50 uh, stores in medium term. Okay, the third point is that uh, it has a better margins as compared to its peers. So the blue line here actually indicates um, uh, Sing Xiong's uh, gross margin and the black line is actually the average of its uh, peers. As, yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, in the last quarter, they have actually hit 25% uh, 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 gross margin profit, which I will be showing in, yeah, in this chart as well. Uh, they have actually hit this target at um, last quarter and 25% um, gross profit margin is actually quite high uh, in um, the supermarkets industries. So they are uh, actually still ongoing on their margin enhancement initiatives to improve their margins and also sustain their gross margin at 25%. So how do they do that? Uh, they go by three... Uh, different methods. First and foremost is uh, direct purchasing via direct purchasing as well as bulk handling. So they are going to capitalize on their Mandai, uh, their distribution center in Mandai Link, where they would be able to uh, purchase in bulk and hence um, get a better uh, bargaining power with the suppliers. Secondly, house brands. So uh, via their own private labels, they will be able to extract more value from the value chain. Thirdly, uh, thirdly via its uh, sales mix. So from this chart, as you can see, uh, as you can see that uh, they are trending to provide more fresh food as compared to uh, the grocery. Fresh food actually provides a higher, um, almost double of a uh, groceries uh, margin. And uh, they are targeting of a sales mix of 45% to 55% uh, by next year. They are also uh, ongoingly uh, renovating old stores to revive a uh, footfall while installing self-payment system to enhance uh, their customers' uh, purchasing experience. So the last uh, investment merits will be on their strong uh, financial position where you can see that uh, they have a very sus uh, they have a sustainable increase in their net profit as well as uh, EPS and they have been consistently uh, paying out up to 90% of their net income in the past 4 years and we think that uh, with this um, resilient uh, earnings uh, we think that the dividend payout ratio should be sustainable in uh, the next 2 years so this chart is actually uh, just a snapshot of its last quarter's results. Where you can see that uh, most of it are improving and it has a very strong uh, cash flows. So this uh, slides uh, summarize all the kiwis and just to uh, highlight on the kiwis uh, which we have been seeing um, in near term. Uh, firstly, would be on uh, 
the intense uh, competition in the supermarket industry uh, in tandem to the uh, SG50 promotion. As you can see that all the retailers are actually um, having a um, promotions uh, during this period to jack up the volume of sales. And um, for Sing Shong, uh, due to their margin enhancement uh, initiative, uh, we'll be seeing uh, store closures. Um, but that should be a temporary um, e effect. And uh, last but not least, uh, there might be some uh, co cost uh, pressures coming from uh, the manpower side um, as uh, Singapore is undergoing uh, restructuring. So this is a peer comparison uh, in terms of valuation for Sing Chong in as compared to its peers across uh, the um, Southeast Asia region. So to conclude uh, the presentation, um, the four key investment merits on uh, why we should consider uh, Sing Chong is that it has a very supportive macro fundamentals and uh, Singapore consumer trend. The growing story, the growth story uh, remains intact. It has a higher margin and ongoing margin uh, enhancement initiatives to support its, uh, to sustain its uh, high, higher margin as compared to its peers. It has a very strong cash flow and uh, zero debt. As such, uh, we have uh, an, an accumulate rating with target price of 96 cents. Yep, so this uh, ends our presentation for today uh, for the webinar. We now open the floor to any uh, Q&A, uh, any questions. Hi, uh, there's a question on uh, whether Sing Chong has an online store. Uh, yes, um, it actually has an online uh, website called all4u.sg. Um, but at the moment, uh, the management is not focusing on um, expanding its e-commerce uh, distribution channel as uh, the, current, um, the current model is they are only uh, distributing in the focusing on the Ang Mokyo Bedo uh, site, that particular region only. So uh, the management uh, did uh, mention that when they have a much more uh, extensive um, distribution uh, channel in terms of uh, outlets, number of outlets island-wide, uh, they might consider to uh, expand their e-commerce um, market uh, due to a uh, logistic cost as well.
Hi guys, Do Hong here. There's a question on FCT, yeah? and the question is how is um, what is the difference between Fraser's Center Point Trust and Fraser's Commercial Trust, and then asking about comparison between these two. Basically, Fraser's Cent they are all under the same parents, but Fraser's Commercial is basically doing with office properties. So they own like um, Alexandra, Techno Park, they own Market Street, 55 Market Street. They have three office buildings in Singapore, China Square as well. So you're looking at one is office building, the other one is retail malls. As to which one is a better buy, I think we, we do not have coverage on Air Alphrases Commercial, but in line with what we are trying to push out for this session, in that we are trying to advocate defensive stance, a more stable, looking for a more stable kind of stocks, right? If you look at office buildings, their dynamics are different. Office buildings they are more reactive to the to the to the ups and downs of the economic cycle. But if you look at suburban malls, a lot of necessity spending, they are less reactive and therefore more stable. So um, I think if you were to try to advocate a more defensive stance, then Fraser's center point would be a more defensive one. So I, 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 I don't cover Fraser's commercial, but I think a, a few comments I can make is that the they, they own three properties in Singapore office buildings and some office buildings in Australia. Australia market, I'm not too familiar, but the... Um, the three office buildings in Singapore that they have, I would say they would be relatively more insulated than the other office REITs. If, or like all those office REITs that own offices in the prime CBD area, because the prime CBD area is where we are going to see the huge influx of supply in the next two years. So, but if you look at Fraser's commercial, right, they have Alexandra Techno Park, which is more to the suburbs area, is in Queenstown area. That one should be relatively stable as the as the government advocates like decentralizing as well. So I think if you compare Fraser's commercial versus like Capital Reed or Capital Land Commercial Trust, their office building should be able to stand out and 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 um, hold on more hold on better when the supply comes up. And another question on East Point, whether it belongs to FCT? No, East Point is not under FCT.
Hi, uh, this is Richard speaking. Uh, there's a question on, uh, do I think that historical spread between uh, 800 Super and STI is sustainable? Uh, short answer to that is no. Um, S 800 Super being defensive, there'll be times where it outperform the STI, there'll be times where it underperform the STI. That is the same with every other stock. Nothing consistently outperforms the STI. But in this context, we are saying that if you, if um, market is coming down, you want you want to protect um, your investment, you should buy defensive. This is the time to go defensive. Thanks. The Kiga for uh, Sing Xiong's uh, EPS is about 2.5% uh, per annum uh, since its IPO to uh, Hey, Jesslyn, Dr. Hong here. Your question on this point more. Just now I was talking about it not belonging to FCT. Yeah, so just to just to add on, this point more is not under FCT, but it's under the parent. It's under Fraser Center Point Limited, the developer. Hi, um, there's a question on a web, on Sing Xiong's um, competitive advantage. So uh, we think that um, Sing Xiong actually has a better um, um, advantage in terms of uh, cutting off the middleman, um, especially in their fresh foods. So for Sing Xiong, as we know that uh, they start off uh, with the pork business, right? Then uh, they the meat that they, they are selling is actually processed and cut up by their own staff rather than going through a third party distributor like how NTUC as well as a giant did. So that part also uh, they actually um, be able to extract value from that uh, value chain. And uh, for their store location, actually for, um, for their future expansion plan, uh, as we know that uh, actually the government is uh, trying to revive the old um, HDB area as well. Uh, so the management actually um, did give a guidance that uh, in near future, um, we will be seeing more uh, supply for small stores, small retail space. So all these kind of um, retail space, right? Um, NTUC as well as a uh, giant uh, would wouldn't have uh, so much interest in, but for Sing uh, but that's uh the opposite for Sing So uh, this is where they will. Uh, this is the direction that they will be expanding in. Uh, although that it might be a, a smaller retail space, but uh, they are actually uh trying to um extend their reach uh in to areas where they do not have presence in at the moment. And uh, that is actually uh, very important for um, a neighborhood uh, supermarket stores like Sing Shong, where custom uh, where consumers actually uh, go to the nearest proximity stores rather than um, rather than uh, taking a bus or uh, going further away from their home uh, to purchase uh, their daily necessities or even for their uh, food.
Uh, yeah, there's a this is Richard speaking. There's a question. Uh, if we do not want to be conservative, what would you recommend as the antithesis of the hundred super? So, uh, obviously, you want to go and buy a high beta stock, and um, so the sector that would come to mind is the banks. Hi, uh, there's a question on a uh, comparison of uh, Sing Xiong's uh, PE uh, to Dairy Farm. Um, actually, as we know that Dairy Farm has actually been bit, uh, better down by the big uh, foreign exchange at the moment. So um, the PE for the PE for um, Dairy Farm is actually quite low at the moment, and uh, for Sing Xiong's case, it actually has a better uh, P growth as compared to dairy farm. Um, this note that this uh, P growth is actually um, from Bloomberg's uh, consensus. Hi. Uh, if there's no further questions, uh, thank you for tuning in uh, this week's uh, webinar. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you.